So before I, before I got the PhD, I assumed that's all you needed, a PhD, really. I thought after I get this PhD, I am welcome everywhere. I will get every opportunity. Everybody will just want to work with me and people will finally take me seriously. Really. And um, also, I think that's one of the things that also kept pushing me, you know, to finally be taken seriously. Like, don't just say, oh, she doesn't have a PhD, right? Because I, have a f I, I know, because I've been there, that when you don't have a PhD, you might feel inferior when you're sitting around a, a group of people who have PhD and they're speaking. And although you might have a better point to make than the rest of them, you, you hold back because you're like, oh, these people, they, they, you know, they know what they're talking about. They have this PhD. So that is what I thought. And then I got the PhD. And then I realized, like I said to you, the PhD just gives you a seat at the table. Does not mean that you are allowed to participate in the discussion at the table. And this is my experience. Other people, of course, would have different experiences. So I'm Dr. Lorato Mokwena. Um, I have a PhD in linguistics. Um, I do research. I'm a researcher. So my research is based on linguistic landscape. It's based in the field of linguistic landscape. And I do research on particularly sparsely populated areas like the Northern Cape. I do research on morality, indigenous knowledges, specifically the people in the Northern Cape. Um, and that's what I do for a living. I write. I'm an author. So I write different articles on different topics related either to the research that I do or related to personal experiences, and that's who I am. When I was young, yeah. I wanted to be a social worker. <laughs> I told my father, I'm going to be a social worker who drives a blue car. And so I always want to be a social worker, I don't know. I think it's because, you know, when we, when we grew up, um, you were sort of... I don't know, it's because of the type of communities we were in where you always wanted to do work that could help other people and help humanity. And so I wanted to be a social worker and I wanted to help children and families. I really wanted to help maintain a productive family structure in society. So I wanted to become a social worker. And um, that's what I really wanted to do. When, and that's, a, that's all I ever wanted to do. I wanted to become a social worker. And so I... Leading up to the, well, the years of, you know, finishing, um, I got interested in debating. Um, and so I, my English teacher said, ah, oh, but you, you, you're a good speaker. And I actually won a couple of awards. And so, but, then she's like, looks like you can be a lawyer. And I'm just like, that's not a bad idea. Again, being a social worker was not too far removed from being a lawyer. In some sense or the other, I would still be working with people, but I'll also be working people with people also but when i grew up there were certain job titles you never got to hear there were certain job vacancies that were not normal that were not spoken about um that we didn't know um and so your things like having a phd and becoming an academic was not exactly part of the conversation because no one in my community exactly had a phd so that wasn't part of the conversation we only knew these very you know being a lawyer, being a teacher, being a nurse. So all of those very labor of love type of work, right? Working with people. And as you would have it, I applied to become a lawyer at one of the institutions um, in the Western Cape. And I was accepted um, to study law at that institution. Um, but the funding, um, they didn't have funding for me and my family wasn't in a position to um, pay for the funding and so I had, to, I had to cancel that out and I applied at the, at the University of the Western Cape um, and there I was enrolled as a BA student in the arts faculty and so I ended up doing my BA majoring in linguistics, ethics at the time, sociology and anthropology, sociology, anthropology and psychology um, and that's how, that's how that story went. Okay, so mm -hmm. if, 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 if I get Get you, get you right. Mm -hmm. Is that during this whole um, period, yeah, um, growing up, it's always kind of uh, I don't want to say by accident, but it's almost yeah. like by accident that you, um, it's like you nudge into a specific um, way. But it, it it wasn't like I'm going to go to university and and, and, and study growing up. 
No, 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 no. You know what? In my, in my, in my master, in my masters, in my matric year. So my father sat me down. He said, "Listen, yeah." Because in matric is where we wrongfully start having the conversation about what, um, what we, what we think of doing after matric. That conversation should be happening a long time before matric. We should be asking younger people a whole long before matric. What are you thinking of becoming? Right. So we can streamline the subjects that they take at school with this dream and align them. Right. And make sure they stand the best chance possible of being accepted into different institutions. But in matric, um, you know, in matric, my father sat me down and said, listen, yeah, no child of mine um, is going to stay in my house, um, not going to school and not working. He was very clear. He said, you either stay in this house as an employer of somebody um, or as um, somebody who studies. And I knew he was serious. Um, my father took education very seriously. Both of my parents did. And they took it seriously because they, well, my father brought me books and he banned me from watching TV when I was a child. It was like, I need you to read these books and stop watching TV. So that was also a thing. So when, we, when, it, when it came to matric, it was the issue of what are you going to do, right? Um, and so I was, he knew, and the conversation made me realize that I only had two choices. And, he, and so it came down to a point where I was like, okay, so I need to study social work, of course. But, um, you know, I was just like, mm, the teacher said lawyer. So I'm like, no, not, okay, let's become a lawyer. So become a lawyer. Your mother yeah. and father played an equally role yes. in your intellectual development yes. from, from, from a young age, yeah, yeah. especially the way you're telling them they took they it serious yeah, yeah. And, and they brought you books. Yes. So it's not always the, the teachers. That... No, 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 no. My, my mother, um, we, we didn't always grow up, you know, um, in the most stable of families at all times. I mean, most families have their own troubles most days, right? And so whenever that would happen, because I'm the firstborn, and as the firstborn child, you, you unfortunately, um, you always sort of carry half of the burden of the things that happen in the family. And so I, I, I always remember this one day I came from school and um, my mother, um, I said, I'm going to the library, I have a test the next day, my mother, and she could see I was, emotionally I was a wreck because of whatever was happening within the family structure. And she said, I need you to focus on your books. I need you to focus on your books. Nothing else matters except those books. So from a young age, I knew that this was my way out. I knew it, whether it was um, education, whether it was those books and what those books bring me. But I knew that education gave me a chance. It might not have been the best solution or might not have been the ultimate solution, but it gave me a chance. And it's important to have a chance. And that is what my parents set me up for to have a chance. And so, um, hence, and it was English books. Eh? And so, you know, back in the days with SABC, uh, because I was raised in an African speaking community. And my father knew that this is not gonna work. Not everywhere you go, they're going to, you're going to encounter Africans. And so SABC used to, back in the day, Simunye, SABC one, they used to have the, na the names of the movies Right. And so because I was teaching myself English and my father was helping me with this, I would read out, you know, the name or the title of this movie. And so he would just correct me. If I just got it wrong, he would correct me. If I sang a song wrong in, in English, he would correct me from the get go. And that's when I realized that, first of all, there's no point in, um, in disliking English, which I think a lot of people do, especially when they were not raised. Speaking English, we tend to um, say, ah, English is the language of the oppressor. Um, English, you know, if you know English, you forget the other languages. But we also need to realize that at the current rate, um, English gives you opportunities. And we need to get to a point where we don't confuse the learning of a language with forgetting who you are. And so for me, my parents made that very clear. Um, taught me how to eat with a knife and a fork as if they knew that someday I would be in a room that, that would judge me if I didn't know how to do it. Um, and one day, um, that the drumstick fell off the plate. <laughs> and so my father was like, pick up the drumstick. And my mother came out laughing from the kitchen. She's like, what went wrong? Because she could hear the bang. <laughs> and so my father said, pick up the drumstick and try again. And so all of these things, small ways, whether it is learn how to pronounce things properly in English or read English books and stop watching this television uh, where they set me up or concentrate on your books regardless of everything else that is troubling this family and you and need you to focus on your books. All of those things, right? And my parents weren't educated. By no means. My, 
I'm sure up until my father and my mother came and heard that a PhD is a thing. They, my parents were not educated. My mother dropped out of school in grade 10. Now she's busy building her, her academic career and she has almost like a level six in being a um, great art teacher. So she's built herself up. But she had to drop out of school at grade 10. And my father, I think, dropped out of college or something. So they weren't educated, but they still understood that education and acquiring qualifications make me stand a chance. And that is what um, they kept enforcing in me and all of my siblings. There's, there's, there's two things, and I'll, I'll soon move on to, mm-hmm. to the next question, um, that I think that I need to pick up. Yeah. Two words that you use. A chance. Yeah, yeah. And in, 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 my, in, in my way out. Yeah. My, um, so, out from where? And chance yeah. for what? Yeah. So, chance because where I'm from, like I am from the unknown places of the of the northern Cape. Like these are the places, you know those places you mentioned and people are like, huh? where's that? So I'm from those places. I am from the northern Cape, was born in Kimberley, which is the place everybody knows, but we stayed in Alco and subsequently now live in the Alperswap. None of those places are known to most people in South Africa. So when I say gave me a chance, nobody around me had Nobody around me that was like immediate circles had a degree. And so this gave me a chance to be different. This gave me a chance to step out of what is known. A chance to show that we can do more. And so for me, education gave me a chance to at least be eligible, right? You need to be eligible. And so qualifications experience that so when when i speak of a chance i'm speaking of setting yourself up to not to not you don't automatically count yourself out and so when people say when there's no opportunity you must prepare for it as if there was i think that's what my parents did because there were no universities around my area um so like university came after i probably had finished or was about to finish my PhD. So I had to self myself up to prepare myself, and it's about preparation, so that when the opportunity came, when somebody said, I I know of a university in the Western Cape that I stood a chance because I had prepared myself to stand a chance instead of saying, oh, but there's no universities I can go to around here. My parents don't have money. Because if I had done that, I would have automatically discounted myself because I wouldn't have prepared myself for this opportunity. So that's what chance means, right? At least be eligible, right? And so my way out of poverty, (laughs) my way out of poverty, my way out of not knowing what the rest of the world looks like, because that is what my my degrees have afforded me and my connections and not even connections, connections are such a bad word these days. Oh, you knew somebody, no. Connections, networking, that's how far that has gotten me. My, my way out of assuming that I need to be a statistics, right? That I need to be the girl that got pregnant um, and went to sit, fat and sit. And, you know, my way, to sh- my way out to show other people that we can do this. You don't have to form part of this. Oh, um, I must, oh, I've done with my matric now. Let's just go and work here and work here because, you know, assumedly there's no other opportunities. So that's how it gave me a way out. Um, it set me up to find a way out. Um, and it's really all thanks to my parents. I didn't have any. Remember, there was a condition. I have to go work or I study. Yeah. So my initial aim with my first degree was to get a degree. Um, again, setting myself up. I needed to give myself a chance. And so my father said, just study. But you, but you see, I also knew, and this is the point where I must say that getting into UWC was a miracle. I applied into, I applied in January, and yes, I had good marks, marks that allowed me to get in. But it was nothing short of a miracle that at, the, at that point in time, the right person opened that email, the right person responded, and we could come. It was nothing short of a miracle. Um, and so with the help of a whole lot of kind people, um, I came um, to UWC and I was very confused. I was like, what is linguistics? 
please somebody, what are these things? Because again, this is not discourse I'm used to. I don't know what these things mean. And so, um, admin staff who have become friends and short from family sorted this out for me. My, when I, and so I come, I'm coming in and I'm like, so um, I just want to get this degree. At least just get the degree. Also, I didn't have a, I, I couldn't drop out. There was Nesfus on the other side, so I couldn't really drop out. But there was also this real threat of poverty if I do. And so um, I said to myself, find the silver lining in this. Is it what you wanted to do? No. Is it something you can do? Yes, you can read, you have a brain, you can think, you can write. Do it. Now that time the problem was Africans and all of these things are in English. I got a dictionary. I spoke English me, I spoke it. And this is what I always tell the students that I teach, just speak it. Even if you mix it up, speak it. It will, it will increase your confidence, but you will also learn new words. Read, how else would you learn a language if you don't read? So I just wanted a degree, that's it. And so within getting that degree, I started realizing, ah, I like this. I really loved linguistics. And finally, linguistics somehow was so personal to me that I was just drawn towards it. And I, of course, also, by the way, my family knew that I wanted to become a psychologist. This was, again, psychologist is one of those things that we don't have to explain. Mm -hmm. We know what a psychologist does. So my father, for the longest of time, was under the impression that I'm gonna become a psychologist. He's like, yeah, you're gonna become one of those few black psychologists in the Northern Cape. So my father was really proud that one day he could say my child is a psychologist. Didn't work out. I, so in my honors, I registered to do my honours in linguistics and I didn't tell my family. Also in my honours, my family officially cut me off. My father said, I sent you to university with, for one degree. You got that and we're proud that you did, but I can't financially sustain you anymore. And it was either I go work and find some sort of work with a degree um, or, you know, just don't study or do both at the same time. And I did, I did both at the same time. I did my honors and I did my masters while studying um, because my family was like, we love you, but we don't have the money to support all of these dreams. So hustle. And I did, I hustled it through and that is what, but I must just get a degree. I got it and then subsequently got all the others. Yeah, so way in the journey, yes. did you decide, okay, honors now and then yeah. masters because yeah. If it was a degree, somewhere there must have been a switch that now yeah. I want to do honours. Yeah, yeah. And now I want to do a master. Yeah, yeah. The switch with the honours came, I realised, you see, I've been running away from the fact for a very long time that I'm a nerd. I'm a nerd. I love thinking and I love writing. And so I never wanted to acknowledge that to myself because being a nerd was so uncool for a very long time. And so the switch then is also realized that an honor set me up again for better opportunities than does the, because it's, it was a general BA, that's what it was called. And so I could do nothing with a general BA because it's like, but what did you specialize in? So I had to specialize in something and I chose linguistics. Um, and so also at the time I had been accepted to form part of the Mellon Mays undergraduate fellowship. So the commitment there is you need to register for an honors. And so I was keeping my commitment and registering for the honors. But sometimes we don't realize that in keeping some of these commitments, these contractual commitments, you are actually being nudged in the right direction. Because if those things were not there, um, you, might not, you might not have been able to be nudged or you would have gone very far only to come back and realize that I actually really like being a nerd. So that is the time that I formed part of the fellowship and I had to do an honors. Um, and I couldn't do it in psychology because it's a professional um, degree. And I only had sociology left and um, linguistics and therefore I chose linguistics. And then I, my master's, let's see what happened during my master's. My master's was sort of, you know, almost like a default and I'm, I, I'm assuming most of the things are just like, I'm just setting myself up for better opportunities. But I will say my master's was one of the degrees I never wanted to do. I really did not like doing my master's. I don't think people understand the, 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 the gap or the leap, the difference between the dedication and the commitment that from honors to master's and master's to PhD. Right, and so I underestimated that leap. 
And then I got to the leap and I realized you never wanted to do a master's. And so I was very disgruntled most of the time. I actually was actively looking for a job. Although I was working, I was actively looking to get out of this job and to get out of academia, deregister for this master's and just go be. Again, I also had black textings. I, I, I mean, I had to, my family, remember these people cut me off, but cutting me off didn't mean that I must cut them off, right? So I also had to fulfill those type of commitments because... I still needed to give back to um, this gracious family that has allowed me to fulfill all of these dreams and still do. So I had to give back and I, I give back so proudly. Um, I'm not complaining more than we need to realize that um, sometimes people sacrifice a lot for us to be where we are and we need some, we need to be able to say thank you. And my thank you was working and supporting them in realizing their own goals, their own dreams um, and their own day to day necessities. Um, and so my master's really, I didn't want to do it. Um, it was a drag, but I did it and I completed it because again, I needed to give myself a chance. And um, my PhD, um, never going to do it. I actually never registered for doing my PhD. I'll be very honest with you. The conversation I had then with my master's supervisor was that I'm tired. I'm really, really tired. I don't want, also I just lost my my, my, my younger sister. And um, the registration time coincided at the same time with master's graduation, the burial of my sister and all of those things. And I was tired and I didn't want. And, and so then I was like, I need an escape. And fortunately or unfortunately, depending on which side of the fence you said, my PhD became my escape from dealing with my, my, my sister's loss, who was like my best friend. And so that is how I got to my PhD. But also, I, I had one condition when I did my PhD. I said, I will only do, to my then supervisor, I will only do this PhD if I can do this work, if I can do this PhD and the work relates to where I come from. Because I realized your PhD sets you up. Nobody's gonna ask you about your masters. Nobody's gonna ask you about your honors. People will ask you, what was your PhD about? And then I realized this was the time for me to come into my own being as an academic. And that is how I got to my PhD. Um, and I settled and we agreed that this is the work I am going to do. So my work therefore was based on the Northern Cape um, and my supervisor was fine with it. And that is how I got to my PhD. It took me less than three years, from registration to completion, I think, to finish my PhD. Um, and what drove me, like I said, I, I was dealing with a lot of things. It was an escape. Honestly, it was an escape. Um, not to say I wasn't dealing with the grief and I wasn't seeing to it, but I threw myself into my work. And so I could throw myself into the PhD. Um, and also, when you do, things that you are passionate about, and I, I am and will forever be passionate about the Northern Cape, it was easy. Um, I found pleasure in talking to people in the Northern Cape. It was fun to do my PhD because it finally spoke to who I am. And I was telling a story about the people I know. So it was so much fun. It was hard work still because the, the, the focus of my PhD was, so, was such a niche area that I had to work a lot in terms of which theories are applicable or not, and which sort of, do I really want to use this method? It's gonna, you know, and also the Northern Cape people are, they special people. Um, and a lot of my Africans, a lot of my English didn't work in Northern Cape and I had to draw on my Africans quite a lot. Um, but also at the same time, you look like one of us. Why do you sound like this? So I had to negotiate being someone from the Northern Cape, like a Heiskant, but also being a researcher. Right, but I could negotiate that successfully and so it was fun doing the work, right? Um, another thing that drove me, honestly, I knew what I, why I wanted my PhD. Yes, I didn't want to do it, right? But I knew why I wanted it. And I think um, the MMUF helped me a lot with sort of this, do you know what you're doing with this thing when you get it? And I think if you don't know, um, if you enter PhD and you really are just like, I'm just going with the flow, 
you can go with the flow if it's a security for you at that time. If there's a, like something attached that you can get, like a bursary or something, and you just need some sort of security, that's fine. But somewhere along the line, you figure out the why. And I figured out the why. And I knew that I accepted by now I know I'm a nerd. I love reading, I love books. But I also love telling the story that is less told. And that was my purpose. I went in and I said, listen, since nobody's really interested in the narrative of the less told, um, and I know that the narratives from the Northern Cape are the less told, that is my purpose. And my purpose in academia then would be being the voice and of the people that we, are, that we don't get to read about in these academic texts, right? And the people that are sort of excluded because ugh, we, we, they don't really fit the sort of criteria of the people that we ordinarily want to focus on. So I knew that this is what I want to do, um, and this is why I want this PhD, because again, it, it, it gave me a chance to sit at this table. And sitting at this table now, a PhD gives you a chance to sit at the table, whether you can participate in the conversation, however. It's a different conversation altogether, but it gave me a chance. And so I took this chance. And so knowing why I wanted to do this, and therefore, um, finishing it within the, not the least amount of time, I it didn't have to drag. I registered, I got the data, the data spoke to the research questions, the PhD is done. And so I know that this whole thing in academia, should you take, how, how many years should you do a PhD? You should do a PhD, start it and finish it when you know that it's finished. I don't, I'm not too sure whether we should quantify it, I'm dead sure that we should qualify it and say that if you feel that you have thoroughly answered all of these questions to your satisfaction and to your supervisor's satisfaction, you're done with this PhD, right? And so, and, and, and that is it. And that is how I sort of, that is why I finished my PhD. But also, I am um, sad to admit, but I get bored quite quickly. Um, and so, I was just like, every day, do you know how tedious it is to look at the same thing every day? I was just like, okay, methodology, again. So it got tiring, this back and forth between the supervisor. So I'm just like, you and I know that I did the work, but it was crossing the T's and dotting the I's that get me the, the marks that I deserve to pass this PhD. And I, need to I needed to, to shift my mindset and said, um, yes, you are bored, but is this thing good enough to not come back and you come back with a result such as failed. And so I had to realize very quickly, this, this is about two years because you wrote this document. But when you're editing that document and when you're doing the final checks, it's not about you. It's about who's marking this thing. But also, don't forget, your, your supervisor's name is attached to this PhD. So it's also about them. So it can't always be about you. So I had to sort of step out when it came to the bottom part um, and do what I needed to do in order for this thing to be passed. And that's, that's how we, we're sitting and having this conversation. Is it empowering for a woman to get a PhD? Yes. Why? Yes, because all, any qualification that you have, especially the status that people attach to qualifications, allows you in certain rooms and also can close certain doors for you. But is it worth it? Yes, in terms of qualification. It's definitely worth it. Um, is it empowering? Yes, I think you, you get some sense of confidence knowing that I'm not speaking from about this. I'm speaking about this as a, a doctor philosophy. I'm speaking about this with a certain, you sort of get, um, you, you get a confidence that I'm speaking about this as this professional who knows what she's talking about. So in that way, if, it's, if empowerment means feeling like you belong in a room, um, or not even feeling like you belong, at least saying that I deserve to be in this room. So you might not feel like you belong, but in terms of qualification, it opens certain things to you that an, uh, not having a PhD would have not enabled you to enter into certain rooms. Yeah, so is it as much recognized as outside um, the university or higher education? Yeah. Um, than inside the institution? You know, before I came to university, I never knew that a P with a small H and a, and a capital D string, strung together is a PhD. 
because it didn't matter where I came from. And people where I come from didn't know what a PhD is and probably still don't know what a PhD is. Whenever I tell people I'm a doctor, they assume that I'm a medical doctor. And so, um, however, if I send you an email and um, at the end of my name, I, I put in PhD, you know exactly what I'm talking about, especially if you're within the university circles. So an, uh, an ordinary person is, does not know what it is when somebody holds a PhD necessarily, unless they have some sort of encounter with um, a, the university space or with higher education space. So it's, it's, not, it's not deemed the same way. To somebody on the street, a PhD, I mean, you have a PhD and then what? You know, and then what? Um, at universities or high institution, um, sort of higher degree institutions or higher education institutions, it's just like, okay, you have a PhD, okay. We, maybe we can take your butt seriously. Just the butt, just the butt, so yeah. So before I, before I got the PhD, I assumed that's all you needed, a PhD, really. I thought after I get this PhD, I am welcome everywhere. I will get every opportunity. Everybody will just want to work with me and people will finally take me seriously. Really, and um, also I think that's one of the things that also kept pushing me, you know, to finally be taken seriously. Like, don't just say, oh, she doesn't have a PhD, right? Because I have a, I know because I've been there that when you don't have a PhD, you might feel inferior when you're sitting around a, a group of people who have PhD and they're speaking. And although you might have a better point to make than the rest of them, you, you hold back because you're like, Gosh, these people, they, they, you know, they know what they're talking about. They have this PhD. So that is what I thought. And then I got the PhD. And then I realized, like I said to you, the PhD just gives you a seat at the table. Does not mean that you are allowed to participate in the discussion at the table. And this is my experience. Other people, of course, would have different experiences. And that, it was shocking. Because you work so hard, right? And you're like, right? And then you get there and you realize that, in fact, your PhD, it's almost like, you know how you start your first year? After you get your PhD, you start your first year of being an academic. That is how I look at it. So in your first year, you call the fresh out because you know nothing about university. After you get your PhD, if you want to become an academic, right after you get it and moving forth up until you sort of get to mid-career academic, you are in your first year of now having to learn if nobody taught you or if nobody took you under their wing to mentor you before or during you, now in your first year of um, after the PhD. That is your first year of your academic career and what it means to become an academic. So I want to follow up on that. Um, at that seat, yeah. or that seat that you get at the table, Yes. do you think woman gets an equal share or opportunity to voice um, any ideas and opinions or their concerns at that specific table? Is it open? You have, you have a seat at the table and so you're present at this table and people can see that, oh, Lorato's here. Now, because you are at the table, it will be rude not to let you speak. But whether we are going to listen to what you say whether what you say is going to be equally as important as the person sitting next to you that is male, whether he is a professor or just has a doctorate like you have, it's a different case. So I don't always, I think, I, not I think, I know, that women are not always, they, we all have the PhD and it, it is the highest qualification everybody can get. So even professors have PhDs. That's the highest qualification. So we all have this one qualification. We all have this one thing in common. But the way the university is set up, um, um, your gender matters. Um, 
Unfortunately, your skin color still matters. And that's a big unfortunate. Um, and who you are connected with matters. And so if you're not connected to the right people, um, if you are black, like I am, if you sound like I sound, doesn't exactly sound too Englishy, um, or like I'm too well groomed, um, you know, um, in whatever it sounds, you don't sound right. Um, and also you have an opinion that goes contrary to the dominant opinion. Then your voice at the table might be heard, but it might not be taken seriously or appreciated um, because people benefit from keeping certain institutions as they are. And if your voice is going to shake up things um, and the majority is comfortable and is being served with what is currently happening, unfortunately, your voice might just be nullified.